Hey guys, Rick Says here. Welcome to another episode of the Outdoor Biz Podcast, where I hope to provide entertaining conversations with retailers, brand managers, athletes, executives, and others in the outdoor biz to get their stories, tips, strategies, productivity tricks, and ideas that you can apply and take your career business to the next level. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. I've used Audible for many years now. I'm on the road a lot, and Audible allows me to enjoy the great books I discover or are recommended by friends. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash the Outdoor Biz Podcast. There are over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Start your 30-day free trial with Audible today. Hey guys, this episode is with Veronica Cox. We talk about how she got started in the outdoor biz, her outdoor career, and her thoughts on building brands and connecting consumers to brands via passion. I hope you enjoy it. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Outdoor Biz Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Veronica Cox. Veronica has spent nearly her entire working career in the outdoor industry helping develop and grow some iconic outdoor brands. Welcome to the show, Veronica. Thanks, Rick. It's great to be here. Yeah, Congratulations good. on your podcast, too. Thanks. Yeah, good to chat with you. It's exciting. Yeah. So let's start off with, uh, tell us a little bit about your background. What was your first exposure to the outdoors? Did you do any outdoor stuff as a kid? Well, I grew up in a small town in Iowa, a Uh small college town in Iowa. My dad was a professor of architecture, so I spent more time wandering around architectural interests than I did in the outdoors. <laughs> <Nice>. So <laughs> That's <and> cool. So, <laughs> you know, good good upbringing. Um, most right. of my outdoor exposure was in local and state parks, you know, ambling around, calling oh. it hiking. Yeah. Um, you know, ice skating on the frozen lakes and rivers. Cool. Uh, but so growing up, I didn't have a lot of really intense exposure to the outdoor experience and environment. So you didn't, you guys didn't camp when you were little, you, you just you know hung out in the parks and, you know, as kids, we play where we play. So it'd have to be parks for you. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Some, some great local parks. And we had a state park called Ledges State Park that hmm. had some very cool, um, uh, geological, you know, features and stuff, but hmm. nothing big, no backpacking, no hiking, no real camping as yeah. a family. And when you went to college, you didn't join the, you didn't do any outdoor club stuff. Did you guys go skiing as a group or anything? Um, I'm not sure you could really call it skiing. It was <laughs> in, uh, skiing in Iowa. I mean, come on. Skiing in Iowa. <laughs> yeah, I didn't really get into that. I was more into the art, design, hmm. graphic design culture. Gotcha. Um, because that's how. Again, my my influences and my family, mm-hmm. um, you know, influences were. Um, and that's yeah. what your degree's in, right? Graphic design? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, graphic design with an emphasis in advertising. And so how'd uh, you get to the outdoor industry? Very cool. <laughs> and I feel very, very fortunate. I was doing um, some work as a graphic designer. I moved to California. Yeah. And that was an amazing journey for me. I hadn't been out here. But mm. I once I moved out here, I actually felt really at home mm. um, with some of the outdoor spaces, started to explore the redwoods around uh, San Jose. Oh, yeah, cool. But I was reading San Jose paper one morning, and there was an ad for a graphic designer for a new sportswear project. Mm. That's how they described it. Mm-hmm. I thought, ooh, that sounds really cool. And it happened to be Mont Bell. Uh-huh. And bringing Mont Bell into the U.S., so they were looking for a young graphic designer to help them establish the brand in the market. Um, and so I answered the ad, and I was plunged headfirst <laughs> into the outdoor industry and right. into what I feel so fortunate in really steeping into the industry and, and under, you know, this, this technical line of products from yeah. jackets to sleeping bags, to socks, to shorts, right. um, backpacks, everything. And so you could say my first real exposure to the outdoor industry was through the equipment. That's awesome. And Mont Bell was, you know, a very authentic, even though they weren't in the U S at that time, authentic yeah. outdoor brand in, in Japan. Huge in yeah. Japan, yeah, and also some of the best 
technical, more forward thinking technical gear right. that was actually coming into the U S market. Right. Um, and I think my appreciation around, you know, I talked about growing up in a design family. I almost went into industrial design as a profession. Oh. And so learning about the products and the product features and the critical nature and the relationship of the human to the product mm -hmm. and the use of the product and understanding the, the life-saving features of the product. And I think it was interesting, I thinking about this podcast and some questions you might ask and thinking about my first experience, it was really interesting for me to reflect back on how I really learned about the outdoor industry mm -hmm. and about being prepared for my experience in the outdoors through really understanding some of the best technical products right. that were coming into the market. Right. So, and you got to, I mean, jumping in, you know, head first with Mont Bell, you got a great education in all the activities and full disclosure, folks, Veronica and I worked together on this project at Mont Bell many, many years ago. So I know yes. the story well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, I, feel very, very fortunate because I was just plunged head first. You know, yeah. I worked with you with your many years and background, uh, Vicki Boyack, who was previously a buyer at Western mm -hmm. Mountaineering. Um, and then Doug, Doug Robbins, yeah. Doug was, I have to give Doug props. He was so, you know, he's so, acclaimed in the outdoor industry mm -hmm. uh, for what he had done. But, uh, you know, he taught me actually how to climb rock climbing, <laughs> learning how to rock, you know, some kid, some funky kid from Iowa learning how that to That was my climb. next question. You got to go on some exciting adventures with those oh, Montbell guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like with Doug, he, you know, he taught me how to climb. He taught me about writing, you know, writing and infusing the passion and meaning Yep. into something like a product description, you know, and, um, he actually, you know, unfortunately for the people that he connected me with, he connected me on these, uh, <laughs> photo shoot trips with, uh, some people he knew who were national geographic photographers right. and that some of those trips were amazing, uh, just amazing experiences for me and very humbling. Me, not oh, only I was very family. envious. You got to go on some great stuff. It's like, holy cow, <laughs> well, how come I can't go on that? <laughs> how come I can't go with you, those guys? <laughs> if you know, knew what was going on in my head, I don't think you'd be envious. Um, <laughs> if I can tell you a little bit about one of those trips. Yeah, yeah. So it was at the time that Mont Bell was bringing in some of the most advanced rainwear uh, to the market. And um, it, it was also at the time Gore-Tex shower tests were the ultimate test of right. whether or not the rainwear was functional. So Doug had this idea to create the Mont Bell shower test. And he wanted to have pictures taken of somebody rappelling down a huge waterfall. <laughs> and that waterfall, he started to conspire with Bill Hatcher who, if anybody's listening to this, look look him up online. Bill Hatcher is a wonderful photographer and a yeah. National Geographic photographer. But he connected with Bill, and they uh, dis decided that this shower test would be done at Deer Creek Falls in the Grand Canyon. <laughs> and if anybody knows that, it's a 150-foot waterfall. <laughs> And Ronnie had never been backpacking before. <laughs> I had never been backpacking. Um, so Doug hooked me up on this trip. We were going to go in from the North Rim. It was a 10-mile hike. I think it was about a 5,000-foot descent to get to where we would camp overnight, do the shoot. I was dressed, funny enough, head to toe in Mont Bell. <laughs> like, <everything>. right. <laughs> because that's all I knew. Yeah. And then uh, I got my first pair of hiking shoes. They were a pair of five tennies, yeah. um, which was great because they were, I didn't have to break them in and going on this hiking trip was the first time I had worn them. Wow. So my goal was <laughs> to keep up <laughs> um, and to not look like, I don't, I not I'm embarrass not sure yourself. To, not to embarrass myself, but I'm yeah. I'm sure I did. But so it was a it was a great trip. Um, you know, going with 
Bill and this guy, the other guy, Andy Marcourt, mm-hmm. uh, hiked in. It was pretty sketchy going in. I mean, Doug had played it like it was this nice, fun uh, thing. But you well, did Doug play plays it. a five eleven climb like it's a nice, fun, <laughs> casual thing. Yeah, but we got to the end of the day, and I won't go through all the trials and tribulations. And I remember uh, it was like in the middle of the afternoon, and all of a sudden. Bill and Andy with their 80 to 90 pound packs, because I had a little 20 pound pack. Mm. They had all the gear, the climbing gear, everything they needed. They started running. Hmm. I'm like, what is going on here? (laughs) And I'm like, just keep up, just keep up, just keep up, just keep up. (laughs) We get to camp right as it's getting dark. And the reason they had started running is they realized we were behind in time and they didn't want, you know, nightfall to come. Oh, and that's okay. not be at camp. So, right. you know, they're smart guys, right? Yeah. Um, but it was it was an amazing trip. So we're eating dinner, um, cold beans and uh, tortillas. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> cold refried beans and tortillas. They yeah. know burritos. <laughs> and uh, Andy's talking to um, uh, Bill. Hey, Bill. That was the sketchiest hike I have ever been on. And Bill's like, yeah, we took, he's like, we took the wrong trail. Oh, wow. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> so I felt a little bit better about it after I'm just And like, you kept up. So you're badass. <laughs> you could say that, but yeah. That's so awesome. that was, that was a fun trip. And, and on it, I have to be honest. I mean, we did the photo shoot. They did the waterfall shoot all by themselves. They couldn't, I mean. They got some great images, was, if I remember right. Oh, yeah, I actually still have a copy of that. It's oh, cool. a beautiful shot. Yeah. But um, I wasn't really able to help them with the waterfall shoot, as yeah. you can imagine. It was fun to watch it from down at the Colorado River. But um, I, I felt really accomplished that I could help them with all of the other kind of out shoots that we did where we took different packs and we took different shorts and we took different scenarios oh, down cool. in the valley yeah. where we were able to get a whole collection of photos from Mont Bell. And I was able to redirect Bill and some of the things he was doing to actually make them usable images. Look realistic, which, right? Yeah. So for me, it was nice to actually feel like I had some value on that. Yeah. Trip. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. It was fun, you know. But I'm I was the person down at the at the base of the canyon at camp going, So where did we come from? And <laughs> making them point to where we came from. Way over there. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Did some other really cool photo shoots in um kind of the bishop area with uh, Gordon Wiltsey too, which oh, right, I right. go into but another classic yeah. guy, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. And so yeah. you were at Mont Bell for quite a few years, and then where did you go from there? Because I think you went a couple places before you got to Eagle Creek. Is that right? Um, I actually moved back to the Midwest thinking that I would get back into pure graphic design mm-hmm. and um, what I call pure graphic design because I had taken on a role at Mont Bell, which I realized was actually my professional calling once I – once I went back to the Midwest to rediscover my graphic design roots, Mm -hmm. I realized that I was now an advertising and marketing, uh, professional that. Yeah. You got exposed to so many more things other than graphic design at Mont Bell. So yeah. And and that was production and advertising, like you say, and art directing was huge. And trade show trade shows. Uh, Right. Oh God. I forgot about that. Yeah. You know, looking at Booths. the holistic <laughs> approach to what a brand does. Right. And then also just learning from Doug and from Tatsuno and everybody about what a solid brand is about and what a passionate brand is about and right. the meaning behind the products. And when I was a practicing graphic designer, my strength was actually more in concept development than the impl- than the visual implementation. Mm-hmm. And so I really found a home there uh, with concepts. So I went to the Midwest, um, moved back, moved back to my roots, back to my, you know, uh, des- graphic design friends and that um, echelon. And I just didn't, I just didn't fit there anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, because of, you know, my newly found interest in the outdoors. Mm-hmm. 
outdoor environment and also, like I mentioned, my development as a marketing and advertising specialist rather than necessarily the strengths being in graphic design. Right. So I decided that I would come back out to California. loved it so much. And, um, you know, it was when I found out that Eagle Creek was growing. Crazy. Growing, uh, leaps yeah. and bounds, yeah. leaps and bounds. And mm-hmm. had seen that brand at the shows when I had worked for Mont Bell. I had worked for Mont Bell probably three and a half, maybe four years. Okay. Found out about the position at Eagle Creek, and it was it was it was great. I was actually their first. Um, they had the the different marketing functions broken up. Different people. Packaging was with one person. Right. You know, packaging and trade shows. Mm-hmm. Um, all the catalog development, the ad planning. You know, different three different people right. were were seeing the marketing function. So I came in. And that was the first time they put it under one umbrella mm-hmm. uh, because of the experience I had gleaned at Mont Bell. I was able to take that all in and run with it and develop their marketing department there. Yeah, and then we that was when we really tightened everything up at Eagle Creek and helped, you know, through with a couple of other brands like Ex Officio create adventure yeah. travel as a category. Yeah, and Lonely yeah. Planet books. Lonely Planet, right, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. That was fun. It was really fun. And uh, actually, we we launched the first uh, Eagle Creek website in 1995. Um, that was a time when brands having websites was actually few and far between. Right. So right. it's a, a big accomplishment. That was huge. Time. Yeah. And uh, you got to go on some exciting adventures with Eagle Creek too. I think you took adventure advantage of some of that adventure travel connection, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of the biggest trips was a combined work personal trip uh, to Peru to mm. some of the areas there where, interestingly enough, one of the adventure travel photographers we were using at Eagle Creek, his name is David Bleherd, they were starting to do more tours and guides around uh, that area, around uh, Peru and Cusco and mm-hmm. you know some of those beautiful areas. And um, he wanted to do a test trip with a few people oh, so nice. as, yeah. a, as a guinea pig, but he had, he and his family had been traveling to Peru for maybe 20 years by that time, made tons of friends mm. there, you know, the locals, mm-hmm. um, you know, bouncing around in the mountains and stuff. And so we were able to go on that trip with him and, uh, you know, it was, it was so fun. It was amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, threw on a pack at Machu Picchu. <laughs> yeah, right. Sure. And snap a few photos realized, here. Yeah. Yeah. Realized, you know, authentic and inauthentic because you'd never take, you know, unless you came in on the Inca Trail, you really wouldn't take a pack, you right, know, right. To, on a day trip to Machu Picchu, which right. is kind of funny. You know, yeah. it was the first time I learned about, you know, setting the stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... It's interesting. So you and you had a little stint at Buck Knives. So you worked with yeah. three brands that really have a strong, passionate connection with their consumer. And it seems yeah. to me these days that a lot of brands have lost or ignored that connection. What's your thoughts on that? I think that is the most important. It well, first I think a brand foundation, a really solid brand foundation and story and meaning to a brand, Mm -hmm. um, is the most important piece that people can, are able to feel passionate towards the brand, that there's a backstory. Let's them connect. Yeah. Yeah. Without the backstory, without the connection, I think people do get lost and lost that they don't continue to see the value of really growing that passion piece of the brand. Right. Um, I have this kind of philosophy that the outside can exist without the inside, but the inside can exist without the outside. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and it's basically just that if customers aren't connected with you or your brand, they're going to leave. You know, if they or, or it's just going to become a transactional you know, yeah. brand and transactional relationship where sometimes you get them and sometimes you don't. Right. Yeah. Oh gosh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I think that it really helps keep that value Yeah. and realizing, you know, there's brands, recent brands that have come in 
um, that have actually redefined the value of a certain type of product. Right. And people thought maybe the value was, say, in the, I'll just say, low $30 range. People have come out now with these beautiful products, really well made, really mm. great backstory where they're selling them, you know, $55, 60 dollars $100, twice as much. Yeah. yeah totally. Four times as much. I mean, yeah. Look at Yeti coolers. Oh. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> that one is yeah, they're killing phenomenal. It. Yeah. Who would have thought? Yeah. 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 No, I think we get too too caught up in chasing the sales side of the biz and, and forget that, you know, wait a minute, there's a whole nother you know, level of passion that we want to drive yeah. our consumers towards. And if you do that, like you say, if you hammer that home, the sales will come. And we've proven that in the brands we've worked with. So, Yeah, the, <clears throat> it's been interesting, especially to, in today's retail environment mm-hmm. and helping the retailers understand if they build a place to come and a place that's meaningful. Right. It has to be meaningful, though. Right. They have to understand what the customer truly wants. And I think for me kind of being from the outside in still I feel is looking to the outside, looking to what they're saying, not to what we're saying. Right. Because I think so many brands look inside for their answers rather than outside right. in how they want to solve, say if they're having problems with sales, they get nervous and they get concerned, they cut budgets, they don't they look inside for their answers rather than understanding what's going on on the outside and what's going on, why consumers aren't responding. And even just from a financial perspective, working with a couple of the CFOs that I've worked with who were just refreshing where they understood that you needed to invest in marketing at the Mm -hmm. times where you were having a tough time with sales. Um, Some great, great CFO financial gurus that I've worked with and some not, you know, somewhere they just wanted to cut everything off at the <laughs> knees because they didn't want, you know, because they needed the books to balance. Yeah, exactly. Or they needed to hit uh, some quarterly number. And yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's, it was really fascinating uh, through my career working with different types of finance minded and operations minded right. people. Yeah. yeah. I read somewhere too that I think if you, the, a brand is defined the, by the consumer. The consumer defines the brand, right? So mm-hmm. what what you put out there and what you mm-hmm. talk about and what you say and what you do is what mm-hmm. the consumer defines you as. And I think a lot of people, as you're saying, don't understand that you need to look to what the consumer is saying to help you figure out what's going on, right or wrong. Because yeah. you can throw out all the words words and mm-hmm. you know copy you want, but if the com- consumer is not buying into it, it ain't right. working. So, yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And, and, and realizing that just because there's a lot of people out there who may on the surface look like they could be your customer, right? they may not, you right. know, so really right. looking below the surface to see where that matches yeah, dig deep. Um, yeah. to your brand. Yeah. And it, it's interesting, a very wise man uh, once mentioned to me, uh, that a brand is made up of the sound bites that the consumer gathers throughout their day, their month, their year, their life. Hmm. So the sound bites is what that customer understands about who the brand is. Mm-hmm. And that's really helped me in, you know, a lot of people will go from one story to a, a new story two years and a new story. Mm -hmm. Whereas your consumer may only have, um, exposure to your brand maybe eight times during that two or three year period. Right. So you want to make sure that those sound bites stay consistent as you're speaking to them. So, yeah, yeah. that's a good point. Uh, let's shift gears a little bit. What, uh, we can get wonky in sales and marketing (laughs) all day long. We don't want to bore people to death. (laughs) What, uh, what outdoor activities do you participate in still today? Today? Well, I love hiking anywhere that I can hike, explore. I love to find the small pockets in my local environment too. I don't like to have excuses for not Ah, getting out. Cool. I have, uh, taken up stand-up paddle boarding, which... I can't believe I didn't do it sooner, but I've been doing it for a couple of years and it's been a lot of fun to venture out of the lagoon and into the ocean. Oh, cool. Yeah. And, um, doing, you know, having a lot That's of fun exciting. there. exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Learning about just the ocean <laughs> is phenomenal. I yeah. mean, I, you know, I, 
I surfed just a little bit and decided it wasn't my sport, but really learning about the life of the ocean has been amazing to me and just having a lot of fun, you know, standing paddleboarding and creating a a posse around that has been a lot of fun. That's awesome. And beach walking. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. 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 Enjoying the sunsets on the beach. Yeah. And if I'm usually invited to go on an adventure somewhere, I'll usually do it. <laughs> <laughs> I've never known you to say no. <laughs> yeah. So um, do you have any suggestions or advice for folks wanting to get into the outdoor biz or grow their outdoor industry career? Yeah, I do. And I have advice for outdoor companies looking at people who are looking to get in. Oh, too. yeah, good. I think for a person looking for an opportunity in the outdoor business is – to really develop an understanding of what authentic means in this space, in the outdoor specialty space. Um, People in the industry will sniff out posers. Mm -hmm. They don't mind if people don't know about it, but people who act like they know, but don't really know. Um, Right. That's easy, easy, easy (laughs) for people to spot. So if you don't know it, don't pretend you know it. Right. Um, Because it's, it's fine. And then for companies, who are looking to add new positions or grow or, or, you know, who are facing some of the challenges, don't be afraid to look at people outside of the industry. You know, they've Mm -hmm. got a lot to offer and, um, you know, they, they can bring in some expertise in other areas. It's that, that may be invaluable. Um, Yeah. It's probably pretty, a lot simpler to teach somebody or to indoctrinate somebody into an outdoor outdoor activities than it is to bring an outdoor person and teach them how to be a marketing person. Right. And I think people who, as I mentioned before, don't pretend Mm -hmm. like, you know, things Mm -hmm. because they'll know, but you know, be willing to learn and be willing to say that, you know what? I don't know. Um, Yeah. Teach me. Yeah. yeah, Teach me. I know about, you know, marketing. I know about branding. I know about product design. I know about operations. I know about accounting, Right. you know, but I'd like to learn more. Take me backpacking. Teach me what this is all about. Yeah. Yeah. And not to say that the the others, the flip side doesn't work. It does, but it's just maybe a little harder. So, yeah. Yeah. The other thing, the other little things are be geographically flexible. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That's, and, uh, and know that it's a job. It's hard work. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not, it, you don't go backpacking every day. You go to an office. You <laughs> That's know? right. So yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of hard work, a lot of challenges. Yeah. 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 It is fun though. Um, mm-hmm. And do you have any daily routines that you do to keep your sanity and health? And mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, um, self-forgiveness. Uh-huh. That's my uh, one of my daily routines. Uh-huh. Um, I meditate. Oh, I yeah, meditate yeah. without rules. Um, and I've been doing that probably... I'd say about five years now. And I say without rules because when I speak to people about my meditation practice, I hear a lot of times, I really wanted to do that. I just don't know how. Mm. And the thing for me is, and what I say to people, and I'd love for people to hear through this podcast is it, there really are no rules. Right. It it's works for you. If you have five minutes, if you have 20 minutes, if you have 10 minutes, um, if you do breathing, if you do guided meditation, and do, do, do you, you use do, a, do you have a tool that you use, or you just? Do I have own? well, <clears throat> like I have do you a, use Headspace for example? No, I use. Um, I have a couple of uh, podcasts that I've listened to, like okay. guided meditations, different people that mm-hmm. I've kind of found. Oh, good. Send, send me the info. We'll put that in the okay. show notes so people can okay. link to that. Sounds good. And then I've actually developed a couple of breathing techniques Mm. that if I'm not in, in a space to do a guided meditation, I do breathing techniques. And then I also have, um, a mantra that's Mm -hmm. a specific mantra to say my birth date, (laughs) you know, who I am. So I, Mm -hmm. I did that and, you know, just breathing also eating healthy, Uh healthy most of the time and, you know, exercise and yoga. Yeah. Nice. That's good. Those are all good routines. Yeah, but the self forgiveness thing, I'll tell you, that's the golden that's the golden egg. Yeah, it seems like that and uh gratefulness too, just you know, think oh. about all the things that you're grateful for, not don't mm-hmm. get caught up in all the other crap that goes on that's absolutely goes on in all of our lives every day. Yeah. Um do you have any favorite books or do you give books as gifts? Uh I have a couple. Um the the Art of Happiness, oh, that's a good one. the Dalai Lama. Mm-hmm. 
I love that book because it broke my stereotype of, say, self-help books and what a book about happiness could be. Mm. And if anybody would like a book on perspective and perspective and being a balanced human and being a grateful and thankful human, that is the perfect book. And it's called Art of Happiness. And it's by the Dalai Lama. And it's co-written by a guy named Howard Cutler. And basically, he goes through being grateful for the things that seemingly aren't good things mm. in life, <laughs> yeah. but turning them into, you know, like pain, the, the idea of pain and how beneficial pain is actually to human existence. Mm -hmm. So it's got some really great counterintuitive thinking in that book. So I love that book. I recommend it to people. I give cool. it to people. We'll put a link to that one. Yeah. And then a book called The Culting of Brands. Mm. Um by a guy named Douglas a. Atkins. Mm -hmm. And the reason I like this, and you have to have a certain level of um, kind of understanding for brands and branding and human connections without feeling like brands are taking advantage of people, you know, in the uh -huh. manipulation, because it's basically just taking what people are passionate about and connecting with I that. Like it. I like it. Um, it's a great, it's a great book. It can be a, just a teeny bit creepy at times <laughs> because it does talk a lot about humans, you know, human, um, tendencies. Yeah. And yeah just being but, human. Yeah. yeah. There's one more book that yeah. I, I love. I really begin to love is called quiet. Yeah. And I'll read on the cover here. It's, um, the power of introverts in a world that can't stop talking. <laughs> that sounds interesting. Yeah. I might pick that up. It's by a woman, Susan Cain, and huh. it talks a lot about how introverts make really good leaders. Uh -huh. um, and I really appreciate that because I bridge introvert, extrovert. And throughout my career, you know, I, I kind of sit back, but I feel like I'm a strong leader. Yeah. But I, I don't that, yeah. feel like I need to be in the front of everything, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the person in the spotlight. So I loved reading that book. And it's a great book for people who are extroverts that don't understand introverts. Mm -hmm. And likewise, introverts that are finding their place as leaders. Right. That's um, awesome. So, yeah. Cool. So it's we'll really, and there's to... actually a website called The Quiet Revolution that oh. is an adjunct from that cool. book. We'll put so. links to both of those things in the show notes. And then, uh, yeah. And what's your best outdoor gear purchase under $100? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Dude. This is the curveball question. So those are everybody for a loop. I can think of about six things personally, but my favorite one is the old school Tevas. Oh, okay, yeah. I just got a pair of the old school Tevas, and I think the, the traditional style I, with the no no the traditional style with the wrap around the ankle, yeah, the wrap over the toes, yeah, you know, yeah, a little. Perfect. And the reason I love those so much is they just bring back so many memories of my first adventures outside. Uh, yeah. So it might not be the, you know, the best outdoor, you know. <laughs> no, it's your, it's your it's best gear, right? Everybody's yeah. got a different one. No, that's awesome. Yeah, cool. Yeah. And uh, anything you want to say or ask of our audience or say to? Um, I think just to the audience, I think most of the people listening to this will be people who have been steeped in the outdoor industry for many, many years and just remember the value of the people who may be interested and smart, mm -hmm. but may not be like you, yeah. you know, to bring into the fold. And also even uh, the customer who may not be like us and understand what they need and some of the, some of the hurdles that they actually need to go over to start to feel comfortable in the outdoor environment mm -hmm. and be there for them to help teach them and help lead them and help hold their hand through the process. Because there's a lot of people who just, they're just hesitant because they just don't know. And if you can help them. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of things to be overwhelmed by. I mean, there's the outdoor mm -hmm. environment, be overwhelmed mm -hmm. by that. There's whatever adventure you're on. There's a gear. So you'd be overwhelmed by that. You know, there's a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Well, and a lot of the marketing images are people in these very extreme environments right. that have been doing this for 30-odd right. years. Right. You know? I think we're shifting away from that, though. I think we're getting a little more mainstream and a little I more, so. more yeah. less, less, uh, less yeah. North Fate, less um, Everest-focused. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yep. Uh, and how can people get hold of you? Email, Twitter, Instagram? Yep. What's the best way? Best place is email. Yep. 
And that is? It is veronica.brightseed at gmail.com. Cool. Brightseed is my um, my consulting business. Yep. Awesome. We'll, uh, we'll put a link to Brightseed and we'll put that email in there. And um, so thanks okay. for being on the show. It's great talking to you. It's great talking to you too. Thanks so much for this um, opportunity. And I, like I said, I've loved listening to the other podcasts. So awesome. Thanks. Keep it, keep it going. We'll do. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Veronica Cox. Be sure to check out what she's up to in her consulting business, Brightseed at brightseedco.com. Bright is B-R-I-G-H-T. And you can connect with Veronica via email at veronica at brightseedco.com. You can find links to Veronica's favorite books and all the stuff we talked about in the show notes at theoutdoorbizpodcast.com slash episode 019. I appreciate the support and feedback. Please be sure and share your favorite episodes on the socials. And until next time, thank you so much for listening. If you want more of the Outdoor Biz Podcast, you can subscribe on iTunes and Stitcher or go to theoutdoorbizpodcast.com where you find all the episodes, show notes, and much, much more. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at The Outdoor Biz Podcast. Twitter at Rick underscore Says, that's S-A-E-Z, and my email is rick at theoutdoorbizpodcast.com. Thanks for listening and all the support, and a huge shout out to all my guests, and until next time, be sure to make time to get outside. <music>